So our next speaker is going to help us not be so scared. He's going to help us address that fear. And that fear is the same. When we sent out our survey, that fear was the same, whether it was a Callowit, um, Deep River, or the Ottawa Hospital. All eMERGE docs have those same three fears. So um, I know they are still filtering in, Andrew, because they're afraid. They don't want to be here on time. They don't want it to happen. They want to pretend there's not going to be a critical incident. But um, our speaker is uh, Andrew Wilmore. And he works with us, and he helps us prepare for Code Oranges. He's also uh, the Associate Medical Director of the Regional Paramedic Program for Eastern Ontario, where he oversees training standards. And he is the Medical Director of the Emergency Management at the Ottawa Hospital, which um, includes co-chairing the Corporate Emergency Management Committee. And he gives us a lot of insight into do, what to do with codes and especially uh, disasters. And again, I, I think they'll filter in, Andrew, they're just afraid. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so thank you for the opportunity to chat to you today about uh, emergency management. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, it's a topic that uh, often mandates uh, some element of administration as part of your practice, which emergency physicians are allergic to. And I want to frame this talk as a call to arms for emergency physicians to get involved in emergency management. Because we, day to day in our jobs, get looked to as leaders. When things go sideways, they look to us, emergency physicians in a hospital, to take a leadership role and be able to know what to do next. Usually, in a lot of different institutions, emergency management is relegated to administrators and sort of folks that aren't in our practice environment who make decisions designed to support us in the moment. But who better than an emergency physician to know what is going to be needed? So if you don't have a good understanding of the emergency management process at your hospital, if you haven't been involved in disaster, if you sometimes think of these scenarios of like, hey, what would happen if Start asking questions, and I hope that this talk, uh, based on some experiences we've had at the Ottawa Hospital and some tips that I can give you that I learned the hard way, um, will help you start crafting this in your centers, because it's a really uh, heterogeneous uh, population of hospitals in terms of where they're at, in terms of preparedness, um, and there are some principles that can help you out irrespective of where you practice. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So the... Uh, <coughs> I can't go further in this talk without thanking my team at TOH. I've got an amazing team in the Department of Emergency Management. Um, these guys are constantly working in the background, uh, looking calm on the surface, but paddling furiously under the water. Um, and I'm really privileged to work with such a great team of people. So when we think about disaster, <clears throat> we think about many, uh, we can think about many different things. You know, Lac Megantique is an example of a disaster that happened in a rural community where uh, a train exploded. Um, after, uh, after a collision. We had the, in 2013, a sentinel event for the Ottawa Hospital was the OC Transpo uh, via train collision um, that occurred that I'll talk about later in this talk. But there's other stuff, right? There's a seemingly never-ending slew of mass shootings that have been happening. We have an environment that's trying to kill us eight months of the year. Uh, geopolitical realities and the fallout of them um, as well as, you know, uh, our most recent uh, Code Orange that we had for, a, uh, uh, for the, uh, the bus collision. <clears throat> um, all of these things do have commonalities. And really, if you look at Red Cross, they define disaster as a sudden calamitous event that outstrips your ability to respond to it, given your resources. Um, and they further go to define preparedness as a platform to design effective, realistic, and coordinated planning to prevent duplication of efforts and to make sure that you're actually prepared and have a functional response. So we're gonna go through some of those things. To give you some context, uh, for us, a real sentinel uh, event was the bus versus train uh, crash of 2013 in Ottawa. So this was a very, uh, a very tragic event in which a uh, OC Transpo bus failed to stop at a train intersection and uh, collided with a passenger train. Um, there were fatalities on scene, um, and our hospital actually called a Code Orange based on this. And Code Orange is our response to an external disaster. 
Um, so we, for about two hours, uh, completely redeployed staff in the hospital. We didn't have a very good construct, so everybody and their mother showed up to the emergency department. It got filled up. Elective ORs were canceled. And we really, we didn't do a whole lot of anything waiting for this big wave of patients that were going to come because we had heard about it on Twitter, on the news, from, you know, buddies that were texting us that had heard from someone else. And we got two patients. So we paralyzed a tertiary care institution in the nation's capital for two hours for two patients. Um, so after this happened, and we didn't have a very clear uh, sort of process at the time, so after this happened, the, the senior administrators came down and said, what the heck, people? Who called a code orange for two patients? And what is up with these paramedics in the field that don't tell us what's going on? This is ridiculous. So they had us look into it. And we did look into it. And the paramedics did everything right. So the paramedics established a field triage. They took all the minor patients and put them on a bus. They diverted those patients to a secondary center so they wouldn't clog up the trauma center. And everything went beautifully. The thing that was missing was our ability to talk to the paramedics. And it was completely our fault as a hospital. So we looked back to the administration and said, it's our fault. Sorry, guys. Now, I want to take this moment to say that although that was a bit of a, a, bit of a cluster that day, um, from the perspective, everybody was fine. The people who came in got excellent care. Uh, but again, it was very disruptive. Two things can happen. So if you bring something to light to senior administration, they might say, OK, well, nothing bad happened. Great. Well, next time we'll do better and then do nothing about it. And you kind of sweep it under the carpet. Or you can have an administration like I had at TOH that said, no, no, we need to fix this. And anytime you expose your belly button in a situation that's a bit uncomfortable where your performance isn't perfect is a great opportunity for a little bit of introspection. Now, there's some recurring barriers in emergency management, and I just want to kind of list them out. We're constantly working in the hypothetical. So you're always thinking about, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? What should we do in order to prepare? This is always uh, competing with things that we know are going to happen. Offload delay, emergency department overcrowding, ALC patients, you name it, there's lots of things that are happening right now. So it's hard to sometimes drive a hypothetical risk um, into the sort of uh, forefront of the thought of, the, of an administration. We have to be interoperable with external assets, meaning that there's organizations outside of the hospital that we have to interface with who, do, who we do not control. So we have to have an ability to establish a dialogue. It's sometimes hard to capture the value added to emergency management, because if something bad doesn't happen, it's actually kind of hard to demonstrate from the dollars and cents perspective as well as an operational one. And also there's this trap that a lot of institutions, because of accreditation requirements, just want to tick a box and say, you know what, we've gone over our plan and we are prepared. Whereas there's no actual functional response rolled into it. I'm sure that some of you have seen a, you know, a code orange binder or a disaster binder in some closet somewhere covered in a thick layer of dust that nobody looks at. Um, that's not what we want. We want a functional response because that's what changes the culture of emergency management and emergency preparedness in an institution. And that's the real challenge is making people understand. You know, sometimes I, I say, you know, they have to drink the Kool-Aid. Um, making them understand that this is a priority and that it's a collaborative effort. So you have to guide. So for our, so for our bus versus uh, train uh, scenario, that stung a little bit. And it uh, sort of gave us a moment to say, you know, where do we start? You know, we obviously have a deficient system. Where do we start? And uh, I like this Churchill quote. It's a recurring theme for presentations I give to never let a good crisis go to waste. So we literally said, okay, what went wrong in the bus versus train? We're going to start there. And what we did not have at the time is this. So by show of hands, who uh, has the IMS system in their hospital? Okay. Thank you. By show of hands, who does not know what IMS is? Excellent. So this is very common, and this is something that I want you to actually take away from this talk, is that this is actually a really big deal, because you function under this umbrella whether you know it or not. Incident management structure is essentially a way to organize your hospital's response or any institution's response to a particular threat that stresses you. So if you have a mass casualty situation, lots of patients come in, it's more than you're used to dealing with with your day-to-day -day operations, that's when IMS would come in. And it basically cleans up the communication chain for senior management in real time. So it breaks it up into uh, 
command at the top, so a command structure. You have operations, which is sort of the clinical areas of the hospital. Uh, planning, which are the, uh, you know, the, the people thinking about the relationships we have with other institutions, thinking about the next operational cycle, what we're going to do in the next couple of days. Um, logistics, which, you know, is crucial in the hospital environment as well as the folks who are going to finance everything. And it just makes sure that everybody knows who they are reporting to and are able to actually feed that information back in real time. What we were really missing the day of the bus versus train uh, was some of the ancillary command roles that I can't go into detail here about, but one of them was a public information officer. So somebody who could be a central point of contact to the media and to the public and to families that are worried about their loved ones as to whether or not they were in the crash and they're in the hospital. And we also lacked a liaison. So if we had had a liaison, our liaison, which would deal with all um, connectivity to other uh, sort of agencies responding to the same threat, we could have actually had the liaisons from our organization and the paramedics have a chat and say, hey, you know what? You guys are getting two patients. And we probably would not have called a code orange. So I'm happy to report, and I put Brussels sprouts at the side of the, uh, at the, side of the slide because nobody likes to learn about this, but just like Brussels sprouts, you don't have to like them, but they're good for you. Um, so this gave us an opportunity. Uh, I'm happy to report that all of the senior management was trained up. Uh, we brought in external, uh, external instructors um, to make sure that we were benchmarked to appropriate standards. And <clears throat> we started thinking that, well, that was really effective. We were able to actually respond to a problem and fix it in the moment, and now now we have a better understanding as to how to operate. So we thought that maybe uh, you know, we'd have a little bit of uh, better luck if we reorganize the way that we actually govern emergency management at our hospital. And I'm gonna share this model with you because it's not common and it's really simple and commonsensical. So up until the point of the bus versus train, we had sort of emergency management be a little on the corner of people's desks. So different aspects of the portfolio were on different people's desks and people would basically say like, okay, well, we'll, we'll prepare for this and that. And it was very ad hoc. We stripped that and we actually created a department. Um, so our department of emergency management, uh, everybody here is dedicated to emergency management. So we've got a couple of coordinators uh, who are fantastic, a manager, our director, uh, and a VP, who then answers to the CEO, CEO, and, and the board, et cetera. Um, and this is where I sit. And this happened just fortuitously because we were collaborating. But there's a frontline emergency physician who is attached to a senior administrator who has the power to allocate budget. In a lot of hospitals, uh, even keen physicians will sort of get into the uh, coordinator and manager level and try to really try to get... Uh, processes running, but unless we allocate budget and make it a corporate priority, it's just not going to happen in a sustainable way. We learned very quickly that by creating a dyad model, so a dyad between an administrator and a physician, um, really meant that, you know, I have my own reporting chain. I still answer to medical affairs. I still interact with everybody from the team, but it gives them an in to different uh, clinical areas. So you can have collegial discussions with physicians, you know, the MD after my name means that, you know, I'm not management, I'm not anybody's boss, I'm not part of any union. Um, so I can walk in with credibility and not necessarily having the constraints that someone else within the administration would have. Um, the MD after our name also gives us the opportunity to, to get our seats at table that other people may not necessarily be invited to. Um, and that's really important as a linking role because this gets complicated because it's not just code orange. These are all the codes that we're responsible for, except for cardiac arrest, which is Dr. Viancourt. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of things that can happen in a hospital that are a potential threat to our continuity of operations. And in emergency management, I look at this and say, okay, well, here's our code orange response. And, you know, it's important to have a, a disaster response. And I have to ask, well, have we tested it? Does it work? Are there elements that need to be fixed? What happens if you have a code orange and then you all of a sudden concurrently have a code red, a fire in your institution, or that you need to do a code green or evacuate. You know, what do these things look like when they go uh, place to place? So it's a lot of um, sort of asset mapping and thinking about what could possibly happen that would grind your operations to a halt. We use the all hazards approach to emergency management, which is pretty standard. We sustain core capacities and services for uh, the health sector. We want to 
uh, support high quality performance in the moment and also to champion integrated learning strategies, making sure that we continue our cadence of training to make sure that we're ready. It's not very glamorous work. It's really nerdy. You're dealing with a lot of uh, sort of paperwork and planning, but some nerdiness on the front end will give you robust defenses uh, moving forward. So for our incident management system, um, this is actually what it looks like um, when we start piecing it out from those initial steps. So we actually mapped out the roles of every single individual in the Ottawa hospital, and we identified those areas that are considered critical for our hospital functioning. And we actually identified 25 critical areas that we said, oh man, if one of these goes down, we're in trouble. And then we were actually get down to the granular level and start working with these units to say, okay, you know, we need to have a hospital-wide plan. By involving yourself with every single unit, you can actually uh, change the way in which they support the emergency department and actually drive the point that says, in a moment of disaster, in a code orange, how do we realign our entire hospital to support the emergency department? So to be able to decant effectively, to be able to create uh, treatment spaces. And um, we actually also mapped out which individuals were responsible for each one of these sort of roles and chunks. Within that structure, um, there's also a dyad structure that has also been working very well, where an administrator and a physician are actually attached at the hip, and decisions about that, to, about that service line go through them. And what a service line is, is essentially, you know, if somebody comes into the hospital with appendicitis, what parts of the hospital are they going to touch from presentation to discharge? So by mapping all of this out and being a little bit you know, nerdy and academic about it, you're actually able to predict where the pinch points are gonna be. And it allows you to very quickly be able to figure out bottlenecks and places that need to be addressed in an operational moment. Does that make sense? So that was a big change for us. So we kind of, uh, you know, for the bus versus train, we didn't know what we didn't know. And we really needed to sort of sit down and look at how our hospital functions and sort of, um, and I'm not an administrator by training, I sort of fell into it, but to be able to uh, sort of understand what the processes are and then to step back and say, okay, where do our mitigation strategies need to be? So I'd like to contrast that with uh, another, uh, another case that we had recently, which was the, the tornado in, uh, in, in 2018. So on September 22nd, uh, we had six confirmed uh, tornadoes in the Ottawa region. Um, and uh, just a couple of quick facts about this. Uh, during that time, we received uh, six major traumas within two hours. Uh, we had our usual flow through the department. We had two stroke codes and two aortic emergencies. We lost power at our trauma center. So the civic campus was on generator power for 24 hours, and that reduced our ability to have uh, diagnostic medical imaging and OR capabilities. So we were quite limited in terms of our resources. Uh, refrigeration went in food services as well. So we had to muster and find a way to feed people uh, two dinners, lunch, and a breakfast. This was worse than the bus versus train incident. We activated our emergency operations center within 48 hours, or, or for 48 hours, sorry. And we had what we call a, a code sit rep, which is um, essentially a teleconference with these pre-identified uh, critical stakeholders that have their own fan out list. And we were, were able to bring people together in the first 15 minutes of our notification to say, all right guys, where are we at? Because this could be a code orange. And we rapidly got a snapshot of what the hospital was dealing with. And we realized we can absorb these patients. The pinch point is not on the patient care side of things. Maybe we should be focusing on the power outage because that will affect our continuity of operations more. And so we actually did not call a code orange for that event. We simply called a code gray, a critical infrastructure failure. And our institutional priorities were able to support that real threat in the moment. But we actually had the situa situational awareness to be able to make that decision. We had much better communication with our city partners, the ministry, the LIN. Um, and we were placed in critical redirect for 48 hours. We only accepted life or limb threats. We also captured uh, that information. So every time we have one of these situational reports, we actually capture this data and we actually create a construct by which everything is scribed and kept so that in the after action, 
In the moments right after our, uh, our response, we're actually able to analyze that data in a sort of a scholarly, sort of sustainable way, and then are able to implement mitigation strategies moving forward. So by cleaning up and sort of figuring out what your practice environment is, what you need to know, um, you can actually very quickly paint a picture that you can make a case to administration to actually invest in certain aspects of your care. Because we can't close our doors. Our inability to continue normal operations, if we grind to a halt, people are gonna die. There's an inherent mortality for us not to be able to do our jobs. Um, you know, think of the STEMIs, the strokes, you know, uh, childbirth, you know, the, the really sick people we deal with every day. If we close our doors, they're in trouble. If there's one slide I want you to remember for this talk, it's this one. Okay, this is the emergency management cycle. It is the central tenet to emergency medicine or, or to emergency management. And what it is, <clears throat> is essentially at the top of the wheel, you can see response something bad's gonna happen at some point and you as an institution are gonna have to respond. You're gonna recover because the sun will rise tomorrow, the hospital will still be there hopefully. Some things will have gone well, some things will have gone poorly. Those things that went poorly will sting and you'll want to uh, mitigate the harm and do some preparation so that you can be prepared for the next time you respond. It's really simple and really repetitive, but this cycle needs to be cranking in the background or else you are not prepared. Okay, that's critically important. A policy document does not work unless you're cranking this in the background. But that can be a tough sell, right? Because it requires resources and a lot of times, you know, people say you're working in the hypothetical and you get these blank faces that just look at you at a meeting and you're like, or if you ask for money for something, you might hear, you know, well, where should we take this out of the budget? You know, we work in a very fiscally constrained environment. So it's a little bit hard to make your case. And I've, I've been doing this for a little bit now. I had to kind of help build it from the ground up. And I, I got the luxury of being able to see this process in evolution. And I hope these pearls will help you. Um, so if you want to sort of bring to light a, a, a threat that you perceive as a frontline clinician um, to your administration, uh, get your hands on a formal risk assessment. If you can't do it yourself, you can steal one. Every municipality has a risk assessment. Um, and it basically spits out a matrix that tells you what are the high probability catastrophic impact events all the way down to improbable and negligible impact events. And most institutions will want to prepare for the sort of this end of the, uh, of the matrix. Um, so that helps you sort of get a shopping list or a, or a to-do list of things that need to be tackled. IMS is important. If your hospital does not have incident management, it is the North American standard. It is a very easy sell to tell your administration, hey, why aren't we using standard of care? And that can be an opening to say, you know, great, what about other things that we want to do in terms of our clinical response? And again, in IMS, this is where we live. So you are constantly in operations working within the incident management structure. And the importance of incident management is that just like our bus versus train example, everybody else is using an IMS structure. And if you don't have a formal liaison officer that can speak for the institution, you can't leverage all of the assets around you. And you're gonna be just blind in the water. After action reports are something that are very, very important. So if you ever do an exercise or if you ever have to respond to an actual event, it's really important to debrief. Document, document, document. Make objective points of things that went well, things that didn't go well. And those things that didn't go well, you can provide, provide solutions on the same document. So a mentor of mine, Justin Maloney, told me, when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. And it's true, this is your shopping list. So when your institution is uncomfortable with the response, um, you can basically uh, 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 put this in front of them. And this is really your stick. This can't be on the corner of someone's desk. You know, this can't be one fifth of someone's job. It has to be someone's full-time problem because what happens is you get this roller coaster effect where something bad happens, everybody gets excited, engaged, and prepared. Everybody pats themselves on the back and walks away. And then our preparedness actually atrophies to square one. So you need someone in the background constantly cranking this wheel and the someone should not be the physician. You need an administrator. The reason you're important in this role is that we want you in the front line understanding how things work. And we want you to attach yourself to administrators that are good at administration. It takes a while to learn how administrators speak. Uh, so take a course or two, know how ideas move through your organization, and then learn how to translate that admin speak and those intentions to your colleagues. And that's a huge value added. 
I mentioned the physician administrator dyad. Um, this is a really excellent model. Uh, and it's very simple. You take a physician that knows what they're talking about with an administrator that knows what they're talking about, and then you contractually bind them together to make decisions together. And that way you have things that make clinical sense at the upper levels of sort of hospital decision making. Cost effectiveness is always an issue. You, uh, you know, as, as, as a physician, you can create training content, you can steal it from academic sources. Um, feel free to reach out if you want any material, I can help you out. Um, and you can, because you can get to different tables within your city, you know, every city and town has a training cadence for their municipal uh, sort of pre-hospital workers, police, fire, ambulance. You can piggyback on those and really save the bottom line from the point of view of having to actually pay for an exercise within your hospital. So you can actually get external funding. And it's important to realize that when you're thinking of the hyper, hyperbolic examples and creating efficiencies in disaster, you can apply those to day-to-day -day operations. So dealing with surge when you have 100 trauma patients coming in, lessons will be learned from that scenario that can be applied to the day-to-day -day surge that we have to deal with. Every stick needs a carrot. So uh, if your administration is doing well, uh, show the action items and completion, praise them in public ways, create buzz around what they're doing. Um, because if they're doing a good job, people should know about it. And anytime you bring somebody into your institution to teach something, whatever that something is, insist on a train the trainer model, where they will actually train people in your institution to instruct, even at a greater cost, because that actually uh, feeds into the culture of preparedness. Um, and again, it has to be someone's job. So somebody has to be looking at this, and probably in your institution, even if, uh, if you're not aware of it, it is someone's job, but that someone is probably a non-clinical administrator, probably in the security office that doesn't really understand the clinical realities and what you need as a frontline clinician. The emergency management cycle is not a, uh, is not a tick box. It is not somebody saying, hey, I'm ready for accreditation because I cracked open a book and chatted about it once every two years. We don't work in a vacuum. Uh, we work with a lot of different people and we need to understand where we fit and what our relationships are. And if any of our relationships are deficient and we're not going to get um, access to resources that we would otherwise have, it's important to like look at those things and tackle them on the front end. Um, and that can save a lot of lives in the long run. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much.